It is really great to be back with you again here from Grace Church, the Woodlands, Texas, with a study in apologetics. I call this deep dive apologia. Apologia is the Greek word that appears in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15, where the apostle writes, always be ready to give an answer, a reason, a reasoned defense, an apologia for the hope that is in you, and do it with gentleness and with kindness. The word apologia, therefore, is very important in the Greek language. It's not just saying something and commanding that you believe it, but it's saying something and saying this is reasonably true. This is demonstrably true. And that's the nature of apologetics. We've spent a lot of time in recent weeks on very sweeping subjects. We talked about mathematics as a proof of the existence of God. We talked about many other proofs, classical proofs of the existence of God from Thomas Aquinas and from other scholars. And we've talked about the fundamental reality that is the hope that is in us. Because the apostle says, always be ready to give an answer for the hope that is in you. There are a couple of things that are inferred there. One is that there's hope in you that others somehow observe. That hope comes out so that they say, why, why are you like you are? Why uh, do you think the way you think? And why do you behave? Why do you act? Why do you, why do you show a positive sense even in the midst of very negative situations? This is a great opportunity for witness. The, the, the times that we're moving through should be times when many people are asking, Give me a reason why you have hope as dire, as dark as things are, as confusion, as confusing as they are. Why do you have hope? Well, we're going to turn to a brand new topic within this series today. And that topic is the authority of the Bible. The authority of the Bible. Why can you rest in the Bible as the Word of God? We'll get deep into that after we have a moment of prayer. So, so let's pray right now. Lord, I pray that you would open our hearts and our minds to receive the revelation of your truth that comes out of this wonderful word. Thank you for the Apostle Peter and his faithfulness to you, Lord. And thank you for the Holy Spirit inspiring him to encourage us to be ready to give a logical defense of the hope that is in us when people ask us. May we be ready at all times. Give us mind and heart to understand today. In Jesus' name, amen. One of the great words in the Greek New Testament that is central in our lives as believers is the Greek word pistis, P-I-S-T-I-S. That word means faith and belief. And one of the meanings of the Greek words that belong to this entire family is the idea of casting your entire weight on something and believing that that something will hold you up. When you step on an airplane, uh, you know the old joke about people who say, well, I'm, I was afraid to put my feet down on the floor. Well, the reality is we step onto that airplane and we're assuming, we're, we're believing that that structure will carry us, is enough to carry us into the skies. Of course, our greater faith is in the Lord, and I'm sure you do as I do. Every time I step onto an airplane or, or drive on a freeway, uh, I, I want to make it a moment of prayer before I do that. There are people who say, well, you Christians, you Bible believers, you have faith. I don't live my life on faith, says the skeptic. I live my faith on reality. Well, the reality is that everybody lives by faith. Faith whether that God exists or faith that, does not, that God does not exist. Either way, it is a belief system. It is a way of faith because you cannot prove, that the atheist says, that God exists. But I'm saying back to the atheist, you certainly cannot prove that he does not exist. In fact, I would say to the non-believer, your problem is much greater than my problem. 
You're having to prove that he does not exist despite all of the, all of the evidences that are in place and have been in place for centuries that God is real. Again, we live by faith, whether faith in whether or not Jesus was an actual person in history or, again, faith that he was not. Now, again, if your faith is in the possibility that Jesus was not, you've got tremendous, tremendous obstacles to that non-belief, to that faith system that you've embraced. For example, you have to explain the apostles. You have to explain the fact that these followers of Jesus after his crucifixion were sheltering in locked rooms. They were terrified that they were going to be next to be hung on those crosses. But something happened. Something happened that transformed them. And all of a sudden, we see even Simon Peter, who denied the Lord three times, we see him boldly proclaiming the gospel. And these uh, followers of Jesus then going all over the world to tell people about the Lord. So, so you've, if, you, if that's going to be your faith, that that did not happen, somehow you've got to explain why it did. And faith, faith in the veracity or the truth and divine inspiration of the Bible, that's crucial because it is the revelation of our faith. In my library at home, I have about 700 books, 725 books on my shelves and I've got another 200 books on my Kindle. Many of those books are on apologetics. In fact, if I were to stack up just the books that I have, and I don't have an extensive apologetics library, believe it or not, but if I were to stack those books, that would come up to at least three or four feet. And, and so you've got to work through all of that. If, you're, if your whole eternity is going to be based on the possibility that your faith in God not existing and the Bible not being true, man, you better deal with that because that is authoritative. Either it is authoritative or it is not. If the Bible is not the inspired Word of God, then we're living and basing our lives on an illusion. I'm almost 79 years old, so I'm in my eighth decade of life. And I became a follower of Jesus, a serious follower of Jesus, when I was about 14 or 15. And then I veered away from it um, in, in, in belief, I, not in behavior. I was not immoral. I, I was faithful to my wife. And yet, at the same time, I was struggling with belief for uh, a few years until the Lord led me back to him. Some people bore witness to me in a powerful way when, of all things, I was working in the White House. And these were powerful men and women of God who really walked in faith as they worked for the President of the United States and they helped me to come back to that belief. And I have found that word to hold through all of the years. I found that word all of these decades. I found the word of God to be true. If the Bible is the word of God and we reject its authority, then our whole life here and in eternity is at stake. That's a, that's a powerful, powerful truth. If the Bible is the word of God, and we reject its authority, then our whole life in this world and in eternity is at stake. One day, a skeptic walked in and found President Abraham Lincoln reading the Bible. And this skeptic thought Lincoln was a skeptic like him. So the skeptic was very surprised and asked Lincoln, why are you doing that? What, what are you doing? You're reading the Bible. Why are you doing that? Abraham Lincoln replied, quote, take all you can of this book upon reason and the balance on faith, and you will be a happier man. In other words, see the Bible as much as you can from the position of reason. It's reasonable truth. And where you cannot find it reasonable, take it by faith. He says, if you do that, you will be a much happier man. And I can tell you from studying the presidents to write books about the presidents, my newest book is Two Men from Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, Trump, and the Lord of History. And in that book, I survey some of the presidents and what they believe. 
And studying the life of Lincoln, I have Carl Sandburg's entire set on the, on the life of Lincoln. Studying the life of Lincoln, I can tell you this was a man who had much to be skeptical about. He had a hard, hard life. His father um, would not survey the land where he was raising his children, and so they would be displaced, and they kept having to move. His mother, when he was a mere child, um, took some milk that was poisonous, and it killed her. He grew up without mom. He himself came near death when a mule kicked him one time in the head. He came close to death again and again and again. Lincoln had all of this challenge in his life, but he was a man who could say, take and read this book and everything that is reasonable, take it in. The things that you can't make sense of, believe them by faith. That was the life of Abraham Lincoln. In our time, in the 20th century, and into the 21st, although he's deceased now, there was a man named Norman Geisler. He is the classic apologist of our apologetic specialist in our time. He was an academic. He had a Ph.D. from Loyola University in, in philosophy. And he taught. He founded uh, Christian schools. And he says that one who claims to be a skeptic of one set of beliefs is actually a true believer in another set of beliefs. So if you're a skeptic about your belief in the Bible and the Word of God because you say, I can't take this by faith, then you have faith in your own belief system of non-belief in the Bible as the Word of God. He went on to say, Dr. Geisler, God has provided enough evidence in this life to convince anyone willing to believe. Yet he's also left some ambiguity so as not to compel the unwilling. What a, what a brilliant statement. Let me kind of drill down into it a little bit. What he's saying is that, that the Bible in much of its revelation is so very clear. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And yet there are hard sayings in the Bible. There are things that our reason doesn't seem to wrap itself around. It's ambiguous. We, we can't find an answer. Dr. Geisler would say the reason God does that is so that we will not be compelled by force to accept the Bible and its truth, but there will be a room, there will be room so that we come freely. Now, all of this is in the context of love. All of this is in the context of love. Love cannot be forced. Love has to take some things as they are or as they present themselves. If God just swept the world with total healing and said, everybody who is healed, who wants to be healed of cancer, right now you can be healed of cancer, then there would be many people. And if he said, if you will follow me, then there would be many people who would follow him because they're being healed with cancer, not out of love, not out of love. So God wants us to be free so that we can operate in the context of His love. In this study, we will look at the evidences that are very apparent that the Bible is the Word of God. Now, let me say one more time what I've said in every single one of these sessions. We start with faith, not with evidences. The only way that the Bible is going to speak to you and to me is if we come to it with faith that it is the Word of God. If we come to it to disprove it, or if we come to it for any reason to justify sin, then the, the, then the Bible is not going to speak to us. One of the great mysteries of the 20th century was the fact that Germany was one of the great theological nations. I pastored a church in Germany for a very brief time in the city of Nuremberg after the war, 20 years after the war. And all over the place, there were great institutions of theological learning. And the great question is, if that's the case, how could Germany have gotten taken in by Hitler? How could so many people have embraced Nazism? if it was such a great theological nation. It was such a great theological nation 
that when I was studying in, in graduate school, if you wanted to get a doctorate in some schools, you had to know German because so many of the theological works were in German. How could that be? This is one of those ambiguities. How could that possibly be? I think it's not so ambiguous because the motive for so many of those who were teaching and studying theology in those days, in the early 20th century, late 19th, early 20th century, the, the, the motive was to disprove the Bible, or the, or, the, or the impulse came out of an impulse of rationalism that was reducing the Bible down to just one more piece of human literature. And consequently, they weren't coming at the book with faith. They were coming at the book to, re, to critique it. If you come with faith, the Bible is going to speak to you very clearly, believing that it's the Word of God. I can remember occasions when I was traveling extensively overseas when God would give me uh, wonderful uh, passages of Scripture that, that, would, that would sort of undergird each of those trips. And I would find those Scriptures coming into play at critical moments in the midst of those mission trips into the former Soviet Union and, and into Asia and many other parts of the world. I would find those, those words that God had, God had given me. We call that rhema. R-H-E-M-A in the Greek language. That is when, when, they're, when, when you're reading a passage of Scripture and there seems to be an utterance that's, that's directed at you from the logos. The whole of the Bible is logos, the, the written logos. Jesus is the um, human logos. The Bible is the written logos. And everything in this book is logos, the truth of God. But there are times when we're reading it, and we're reading it in and by faith when one of those passages just jumps out at us. I remember one time going into a very troubled nation, and the Scripture that had been given to me as a rhema word of God as I had studied the Scripture, prayed to God, give me your word for this trip, was a psalm that said, do not put your trust in the chariots of men. And this particular country had its own airline. And somebody had said to me, don't, whatever you do, don't get on that airline. But when I got to the country, I found that I had to fly across the country to get to the place where I was speaking. And I looked and it was their airline. And I became very concerned about getting on that airplane because the Bible had said, don't put your trust in the chariots of men. I took that one way, as you'll see, it, 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 God really meant it in another way. Well, I looked up and I noticed, wait a minute, it's a Boeing 737. Oh, it's an American-made plane. I know, therefore, it's going to be all right. I'm not worried about it. I can get on here because it's an American-made plane. Now, the Bible had said, the Word of God to me was, don't put your trust in the chariots of men. But I was about to do that because it was a Boeing. We got on the plane. We sat there for a few moments, and we did not pull away from the gate. And it was a place in the world where there was no uh, tunnel leading back into the waiting area. It was just a, pair, some, a set of steps that you could went, go back down. And everybody got off the plane to see what was wrong. We were all looking at the engine when all of a sudden I noticed oil pouring out of that engine, pouring out of that engine, pouring out of that engine. And I felt the Holy Spirit prompting me, saying, I told you not to trust in the chariots of men, but you trusted because it was a Boeing. Now I'm going to show you how I'll get you across the country in this airplane. And that's exactly what happened. And I got back on chastised, but in a sense of peace that God was taking care of us. They got the problem fixed. We went back across the country to fulfill the obligation. So the Word of God must be approached by faith. And yet as we approach it by faith, we discover in our interactions with it that it is the true Word of God and all kinds of wonderful, wonderful things begin to accompany our lives. God gives us direction. He gives us guidance. We start with faith, not evidences. But as you will see, the burden of proof as to whether or not the Bible is the Word of God or is not is really on the non-believer who, who does not believe in the authority of the Bible. Here's a fundamental fact. If your destiny in this world 
and in eternity is at stake, you better make sure you're standing on solid authority. If your entire destiny in this world and in eternity is at stake, and it is according to what this book says, then you better be sure this airplane is going to fly. You better be sure it's sturdy and steady and that you are standing on authority or you better be sure that your non-belief is trustworthy and authoritative and even has greater authority than the claims of this book. Skepticism is a very hard way to go. So in these studies, we're going to look closely at the authority of the Bible as the authority for our belief and faith and the living out of our lives. Now, as I've said in every single session, I am not an expert. I am a man who stands on the shoulders of experts. It's impossible to be an expert in all the things we've talked about. So I stand on the shoulders of those who are, those who've devoted their lives, their academic backgrounds. My master's degree is in leadership and organization, not in apologetics. So I stand on the shoulders of those who've, who've committed themselves to, a, to an academic study of this as well as a lifetime of study. And so in this study, we're standing on the shoulders of one of the greatest of the apologetic specialists, a man by the name of Josh McDowell. You perhaps have read some of his books. Um, his current one is Evidence That Demands a Verdict, Volume 2. And it's about like that. Volume 1 is about like that. It is a very powerful book that I would, uh, that I would encourage you to have in your personal library. In fact, that title, Evidence That Demands a Verdict, reveals the propositional character of biblical revelation. Now, let's remember what propositional truth is. If I make an assertion that demands a response, that's propositional. If I say to you, let's meet for dinner at 5 o'clock tonight at the best restaurant in town, I will meet you there, I will buy your dinner, that's, that's, propo that's a propositional statement. If you don't answer, I'm assuming the answer is no. Or if you don't show up, obviously the answer was no. You cannot just let it rest. You have to give a response. That's the nature of biblical evidence. He says it is evidence that demands a verdict. You have to decide, says McDowell, whether the evidence you're hearing is truth or non-truth. And as we go through this, every proposition I'm going to throw out will demand a response from you with yourself before God. The evidence must be evaluated, it must be decided upon, and it must be acted upon. If it's truth, it must be acted upon. Language is crucial to understanding the nature, not just the meaning of the Bible, but the nature of the Bible. In fact, language would be crucial to understanding any kind of literature, any kind of work or idea. One of the oldest languages in the world is Sanskrit. Sanskrit. I'm sure that you've seen this name or title many times. Sanskrit, S-A-N-S-K-R-I-T. This language is 3,500 years old. It has been around for 3,500 years at least. Now, what is interesting is that it originated in the Indo-Aryan area of the world. Let's look at this. I don't have a map, so let me just kind of sketch it. Here is the whole great, the, the bottom of the whole great subcontinent of India. And, of course, it comes up like this into the Bay of Bengal and stretches out into Asia. Here is a very important region. This is all ocean, Indian Ocean, all ocean. The land mass goes like this, and from here it goes to Europe. Now watch this. The region in here is the Indo-European area, Indo-Aryan area. And there was a great mythology in non-biblical Germany and in, in fact, non-biblical Europe in the late 
19th and 20th centuries, there was a great mythology about the Aryan part of the world. This was, these were the supreme people. These were the smartest. These were the greatest. And so the word Aryan, A-R-Y-A-N, comes into our, uh, into our speech. This region, if you went straight up here, you would come into the region of Ararat. And you know what Ararat is. It is the place where the ark of, of Noah landed. And from there, human population began to move out and populate the entire earth. This is the area of the greatest expression of the Sanskrit language. So it's a very, it's a, it's a very old language. At the same time, it's a very important language in understanding history. One of the great scholars... And by the way, it's, it's the language that is the official language of Hindu theology. And also, it is the classic language of India. All the Hindu classics are, are in Sanskrit. And some uh, Hindu scholars even believe that it was created by deity itself. A man by the name of Professor Montiero Williams was one of the greatest of these Sanskrit scholars. He studied these books for 42 years. And then he did a comparative study between the Bible and the books of Sanskrit. And he concluded this, and I quote him, pile them up on the left side of your study table with the Sanskrit books, but then place on your own, your, place your own holy Bible on the right side with a wide gap between the other books and the Bible. For there is a gulf between the Bible and the so-called sacred books of the East, which severs the one from the other, a gulf which cannot be bridged over by any science of religious thought. He says, compare them, compare them, and look at the value, look at the worth, look at the evidence that you find in these, in these books as you contrast them. This is especially important in our times because one of the trendy things uh, that uh, arose back in the 1970s and continues to have some impact is this, uh, is this uh, tendency of some people in the West who consider themselves very uh, smart to go into Eastern religions. Uh, I think the Beatles must have started it when they went to India to sit at the feet of the guru and try to learn truth, even though they were rejecting Christianity. Thank God. I believe one of them, I believe Ringo Starr, came, gave his life to the Lord. But the, but the rest of the time, there was, this, there was this moving away from God by very important opinion setters like the Beatles. And so people were flowing toward India. One of the wonderful things that happened in that was that a great, biblical scholar by the name of Francis Schaeffer, who had gone to Europe after World War II to do missions from the United States, Francis Schaeffer had established a, a retreat, if you will, up in the mountains of Switzerland. I've been to the place called Labri, which means the shelter. And many of these very wealthy young people who were hippies and, and so forth could afford to do it were moving to India, but they were coming through Switzerland and they stopped at Labri. And many of them came under the influence of Francis Schaeffer and through him received the Word of God, received the truth of God. And some of them became great. One of the greatest of those is Oz Guinness, whose uh, writings are stunning. They're, they're very powerful as he turned his heart to the Lord. But those other young people simply did not know what they were rejecting. And that's one of the crises of our time in America because we have so demoted a focus on the Bible, the understanding of the Bible as the very root, as the very ground, the very foundation on which our, our culture of freedom and responsibility has been built through the years. They don't know what they're rejecting. Dr. Moncrief Williams says the Bible is unique. He says it is unique when you compare, when you put them side by side, what you discover is that the Bible is unique. Now, in our next session, we're going to look at just exactly how the Bible is unique. And I think you will be amazed as, as you see that. So tune in with me every time we do these studies and tell others about it, especially those who are struggling with their faith and they're looking for a place to stand Invite them to join with you in watching these series. And I look forward to seeing you next time. May God bless you.